Hey guys, and welcome to Amazing Videos! And today, I'm going to be doing Chapter 6 of Schooled by Gordon Corman. Chapter 6. Name, Naomi Erlanger. The time was coming. I could almost smell it. One day, Zach Powers was going to be my boyfriend. Sure, he was sniffing around Lena. Everybody knew that. But sooner or later, he'd see that she lacked the depth and sincerity of yours truly, and that besides, she had the hots for Daryl, or maybe Grand Tubman. If only he'd get rid of that ridiculous tongue stud that looked like a pimple. Enough said, especially about Lena, who was my best friend. It was tough to compete with Lena, who was so naturally pretty and had to be a very strong personality. To be honest, she was kind of a bulldozer when it came to getting what she wanted. But I don't say that in a mean way. People did what she told me to because they liked her. Not just because she'd made their lives miserable if they didn't. And since I was more shy than Lena, not quite so willing to squeeze into size zero jeans and apply makeup with snowblower, I had to try a little harder to get Zach's attention. Who would have thought that the equalizer would turn out to be the biggest dweeb in school? No, not Hugh Winkleman, Capricorn Anderson. The minute I shot that spitball in the cafeteria, I could feel Zach noticing me. He said, nice trajectory, and he asked if he could finish my tater tots. I knew it was the turning point in our relationship. The road to Zach went straight to the new hippie kid. Example, Zach wanted to make Cap 8th grade precedent. Sure, the rest of us had our hearts set on Winkleman, but I quickly volunteered to work on Cap's election campaign. Not that anybody was running against him, but we still had to make it look real so Mr. Kasigi wouldn't get suspicious. We made posters. My favorite was Capricorn Anderson, the people's choice. Because while I was painting it, Zach said, It doesn't have to be perfect, Naomi. It's not like anybody's going to have to vote for him. And while he was talking, his hand brushed my hand. Lena was a little suspicious when I told her we didn't need any help with the election. You definitely didn't want to get on her bad side. But by the time Zach and I started going out, she'd probably be hot and heavy with Daryl or Grant Tubman minus the tongue stud. So I was safe. Zach was so cool. It was almost like watching the plan beam straight through his brain onto a screen of blockbuster movie. We put up the posters, scared off two dummies who wanted to run for the job, and presto, Capricorn Anderson was elected 8th grade president unopposed. The best part is the doofus has no idea what just happened to him, Zach chortled. Who knows what's, go what's going on under all that hair? I personally got the impression that Cap thought all new students had to go through this, like being president was part of reg registering or choosing electives. But I kept my mouth shut and laughed along with the others. Zach had a great smile. When they made the announcement at the all-school assembly, Zach and Daryl hoisted the new president up on their shoulders and marched him onto the stage. He'd been around C Average for a couple of weeks, and people knew his name from our posters and had seen him in, in the halls. But this was the first time the entire student body made the connection. 1,100 students stood in the sight of the genuine middle school hippie, this tall, skinny, long-haired boy in tie-dye, toes poking out of the homemade sandals. He looked so silly, so goofy, so weird that he was almost cute. Not attractive, but adorable in the sense that you can't help pitying him, like a wet puppy rolled in sand. Zack started shouting, Speech! Speech! And some other people took up the cry. Mr. Kasigi handed over the microphone, and we all quieted down to listen to what Cap had to say. He stared at us for a long time until I was almost wondering if Zack had chosen somebody who was so nerdy he was too perfect for the job. Then he announced, I shouldn't be precedent. Why not? Daryl heckled. Cap struggled with that one. But when he finally spoke, his answer was as bizarre as his appearance. I, I don't know anybody's name. Like, the president had to be able to rattle off the names of all 1,100 of his constituents, or else he wasn't qualified. Peals of laughter rolled through the gym. Even the sixth graders could see how dopey that was. I felt proud and exhilarated. I felt like the woman that's behind every great man. The one behind Zack, I mean. That was fantastic, I congratulated him when he 
left the assembly. He grabbed me by the arm and began towing me to the front. We're not done yet. Where are we going? His oh-so-blue eyes gleamed. If the hairball thinks it's his duty to learn 1,100 names, who are we to burst his bubble by telling him he doesn't have to? You mean... I didn't get a chance to finish the thought because he was already flagging down a very dazed 8th grade precedent. Poor Cap. I honestly felt sorry for him. Freshly inaugurated to the office he never ran for. Well, what would you be thinking? It's... He just... Wanted to get out of there and be left alone. Remember me, Cap? I'm Zack, and this is Naomi. Zack greeted him. Now you know us. It's a matter of time before you get the chance to meet everyone else in the school. Cap's haunted eyes took in the sight of the entire student body, more than a thousand strong, streaming through the gym exits. If it hadn't been so funny, if Zack's eyes hadn't been so turquoise, I would have been confessed that the whole thing was a gag. I'm not good at remembering names, he told us. I don't know a lot of people. We're sure you can do it, I assured him. One, he persisted. One what? One person. I see other people. When we're in town for supplies. But Rain does all the talking. Rain? I queried. My grandmother. She's the person I know. That was the thing about Cap that I would never dare say to Zack. I could never escape the suspicion that he was putting us on even more than we were putting him on. But if that was the case, he had to be the greatest actor on the face of the earth, because he didn't crack a smile, not for a millisecond. Zack pressed on with his plan, and I pressed on with mine. We put a suggestion box in the guidance office for students to bring their concerns to the president's attention. Cap never suspected that the entries were all fake, and that we were writing them in equipment room after Zack was done with football practice. We spent too much time laughing for any serious romance to develop, but it was fun. We were convulsed with hysterics at the thought of our hippie asking Mr. Kasigi to convert the water fountains to Gatorade and to erect a bullfighting stadium in the parking lot. Surprisingly, Mr. Kasigi seemed to be kind of going along with the gag. It was the one thing for him to keep out of student matters, like he did last year with that Simran kid. But when someone asks for a bullfighting ring in an American public school, you have to know you're being pranked. Mind you, when you've just heard that same kid express the belief that a president has to know every student's name, you can never be 100% sure. Whatever the reason is, our assistant principal never took Cap aside and explained to him that someone was yanking his chain. And we really yanked. Zack told him that he had to work weekly press briefings for reporters from the school newspaper. The reporters? Us. We didn't work for the paper, but how was Cap going to know that? What about the n- real newspaper staff? I asked uncertainly. They're not invited, Zack said de- decisively. Those dweebs should be happy we didn't make any of them precedent. The first of these conferences were held in a room that didn't exist. Cap wandered the hall like a lost soul in search of a fictional geography lab. Zack planted students out there to give him bogus directions. Make a left at the music room, down the stairs, through the double doors, and then two rights and a hard left at the furnace. We rescheduled for Friday after telling him how disappointed we were that he stood us up. He apologized and promised to do better. The briefing was held in room 226, which did exist, but was locked. While he wrestled with the doorknob, Zack sent the football cheerleaders to form their human pyramid right beside him. They chanted, Cap, Cap, here's our man. If he can't open it, nobody can. To tell the truth, I wasn't super high on this idea, since Lena was not only a cheerleader, but also the apex of the pyramid. It was impossible to compete with anyone in the cheerleading outfit, especially at our school. Over the summer, the basement got flooded and the uniforms all shrank. I felt better when the real press briefings began. Lena traded her pom-poms for a reporter's notebook, and we all spoke up for the people's right to know. Cap, what are you going to do about the terrible state of cafeteria food? Cap, the boys' locker room is a kespool. What are your plans to improve it? 
Cap, have you thought about air conditioning the school buses in light of global warming? I don't have answers to any of those things, was his grave reply. Maybe you picked the wrong person to be president. Which only proved that we'd pick the exactly right person to be president. Now that Lena was back in the plan, I had to come up with something good in order to stand out in Zack's eyes. I invented a secret admirer for Cap named Lorelei Lumley, a seventh grade student government groupie who slipped for perfumed love notes through the vents of his locker. These are perfect, Zack enthused. I could tell that he hadn't overlooked the bright red lip imprint that I had kissed on to every piece of stationery. Zack had Cap's combination, so he made it into our mansion to see mission to our to see that he never opened the door without finding something bizarre and or gross. It made my favorite part of every day. Pressed against Zack in the drinking fountain alcove, waiting to see what Cap would pull out of the, there next. A rotten banana with a greasy black peel, a goal, a goat's brain from the science lab, a Ziploc baggie of Pepto-Bismol, a dead bird. Cap didn't react very much to any of these things, except the bird. He watched amazed as he wrapped the small body in a paper towel and marched it straight out the door. He got as far as the flower bed. Then he knelt and began scrabbling with one hand in the so soft dirt. Zack peered through the floor-to-ceiling window. What's he doing? Digging worms? That's not it, I said in a tremulous voice. He's burying the bird. Zack was mystified. Why? Cap placed the shrouded little corpse on into the hole and covered it tenderly with earth. Then he plucked a couple of daisies and placed them across the tiny grave. He stood up, removed his psychedelic headband from that haystack of hair, and bowed solemnly. The smart move definitely would have been to hang back with Zack and make fun of the performance, but something came over me. I still can't explain it. I walked out and stood beside Cap. I wasn't a bird lover. I didn't know a cannery from a condor. But the look of sympathy on the hippie's face was so honest, so pure, that it planted the emotions inside my heart. Suddenly, I had to pay my respects to this innocent creature, cut down in the prime of life. It wasn't so much of a funeral. We stood there like junior undertakers while the wind turned Cap's unbound hair into a reasonable fast mile of a rainforest. Death is a part of life, he said simply. This is just another part of your journey. Fly well. I noticed that quite a few kids were looking on, trying to figure out if we'd gone crazy, probably. One seventh grader took off his baseball hat in reverence. I caught a disapproving look from Zack on the other side of the window and silently cursed myself for making a mistake Lena never would have made. Yet it seemed so right, and I couldn't be sorry for that. When Zack became my boyfriend, I hoped I could make him as sensitive as Capricorn Anderson. Afterwards, some of the spectators went up to Cap to say a few quiet words. He asked all of their names. That's chapter 6, and see you tomorrow for chapter 7 on Amazing Videos!